Thank you very much uh, for being here, and I applaud you hearty souls who braved the cold weather uh, today in order to be here. Uh, we are here today uh, with several distinguished panelists to talk about a fascinating book. Uh, it was a fascinating book about a fascinating case, uh, National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB, versus Sibelius, uh, better known as the Obamacare uh, case. And as I read this book, I thought that I was really uh, watching some very, very smart people who obviously uh, respect each other, but who are in no way, shape, or form shy about challenging each other. Uh, and they would advance and refine their arguments uh, as the book progressed, covering many facets uh, of the Obamacare uh, case, some of which they will discuss today. Uh, the, uh, I will introduce all of the speakers in the order in which they will uh, speak, and we're going to start off with Trevor uh, Burris. Trevor was the editor of A Conspiracy Against Obamacare. <coughs> he is a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies, where Trevor's research interests include constitutional law, uh, civil and criminal law, legal and political philosophy, and legal history. Uh, Trevor got his undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado at Boulder and his law degree at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. Uh, in addition to providing a brief overview of the book, uh, Trevor will also talk a little bit about how some of the current problems that we've all been reading about uh, with respect to the Affordable Care Act uh, relate to the case. Uh, next, we'll hear from Professor Ilya Soman. Uh, Ilya is a professor at George Mason University School of Law, where his research focuses on constitutional law, uh, property law, uh, and the study of um, uh, popular political participation and its implications for constitutional democracy. He got his BA degree from Amherst, a master's degree from Harvard, and his uh, Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. Uh, following graduation from law school, he clerked for the uh, Fifth Circuit Judge Jerry Smith. And in addition, by the way, to a conspiracy against Obamacare, I will gladly put in another plug, uh, Ilya is the author of another uh, book here, Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter. Uh, and his articles, by the way, have also appeared in many scholarly uh, journals. Uh, Ilya is going to discuss competing constitutional visions that were at play in the case uh, and also about the role of the Volokh conspiracy in terms of influencing the debate that surrounded the case. Uh, after Ilya, we will hear from Oren Kerr. Oren is the Fred C. Stevenson Research Professor of Law at George Washington Law School. He got a BA uh, from Princeton, a master's from Stanford, uh, and his Juris Doctorate from Harvard. Uh, after uh, graduation, he clerked on the Third Circuit for Judge Leonard Garth and then on the Supreme Court for Justice Anthony Kennedy. Uh, Oren is a nationally recognized scholar in the areas of criminal procedure uh, and also computer crime law. He worked for a while, in fact, at the Department of Justice's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section. Uh, he's argued many cases uh, throughout the country, including the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and his um, uh, articles have appeared in top legal uh, journals and, in fact, in many judicial opinions. Uh, Oren, whom Randy Barnett described as a one-man moot court with respect to this debate, <laughs> We'll discuss what role uh, academics and commentators played in the run-up to this case, and he will compare that with the role that academics and commentators have, pay have played in other Supreme Court cases. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we will hear from Randy Barnett. Uh, Randy is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at, George Wa at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches on a whole variety of subjects. Uh, he is a graduate of Northwestern University and Harvard Law School. Uh, he began his career as a prosecutor in the Cook County State's uh, Attorney's Office in Chicago. Uh, in 2004, he argued the medical marijuana case, Gonzalez versus Rach, before the Supreme Court, and that case actually featured rather prominently in terms of the analysis for the Obamacare case. He's the author of uh, over 100 articles uh, and law reviews, as well as, uh, as nine books. Uh, and Randy uh, will discuss the role of politics played in the litigation. So with that, please join me in welcoming our panel, and then we'll turn it over to Trevor. Up to you, wherever you'd like. Well, uh, thank you very much, John, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation, both for putting this on and for helping out uh, incredibly throughout the litigation of this crazy case. I also want to thank uh, the Vala conspirators, uh, three to my left here, and some who aren't represented 
David Bernstein, Dave Kopel, uh, who was my professor in law school, for giving me the opportunity to work on this book, which was incredibly fun. Uh, got to relive some of my own past, because I had the interesting experience of coming out of law school and immediately working on the biggest Supreme Court case in 50 years. So that was <laughs> somewhat surreal, uh, thanks to working at the Cato Institute. I'm just going to give a few brief comments about the way that I always saw this case. And I lecture about this throughout throughout the country, and, and I sometimes I feel like I have to return people to rudimentary civics class. And maybe a lot of the problems we have with the Constitution as it stands today is because people forgot civics class from 7th and 8th grade, uh, particularly politicians who view the Constitution as an impediment to making the world awesome, which is pretty much often what they do. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to discuss, just so we have a frame of reference here, the way the law works now, or does it work, as the case may be, but the general theory behind the law. It's really important to, to realize this so we can talk about the future dysfunctionality of the law and how this plays into the way the case worked out. So the, the Obamacare is a, I would call it a political subterfuge built on three pillars uh, in order to create the functional equivalent of a single-payer system while still calling it a market. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first, it's a political subterfuge. How is it a political subterfuge? Well, they didn't say that they were taxing you for this. They just made you give your money directly to a private company. Now, there are many, and why did they have to do that? Well, because they told these private companies, the private insurers, that they had to cover pre-existing conditions at a price-controlled rate. So you're an insurance company, and you're told you have to cover all pre-existing conditions, and you can't charge more for that. And you're going to say, hey, what about the money? We need some money. And the government has a few choices. One, they could directly subsidize the insurance companies and raise taxes accordingly. Or the other, they could participate in a political subterfuge and make you purchase insurance so they wouldn't have to raise taxes. This is a huge part of the law. It's unquestionably part of the subterfuge. If you, ask, if you look at the CBO scoring, of the law originally. The CBO has a way of scoring where sometimes if you take control of an industry too much, they'll consider that part of the cost of the bill. And the way that this worked is that they, they asked the CBO while they were drafting the law, they said, how much of a percentage of what's called a medical loss ratio, which is how much the insurance companies can spend on administrative costs, how much of that would, would make you include the cost of the individual mandate in the bill? And they said 89.5%. And then the law said, all right, 89.5%. It's exactly, we're going to put it right there so you will not include the costs incurred by individual people in the bill. So then what happens next? Well, everyone has an idea maybe of the death spiral, which is the, the next thing that you get out of this. You need people to spend more money on insurance than they would otherwise. This is not a bug in the law right now. Everyone's seen that. This is a feature in the law. There's no way it could work otherwise. You have to pay more for insurance than you would otherwise for things that you generally wouldn't cover yourself so you can subsidize the newly sick people who are going to be consuming this, consuming more health care. The, the Obama administration's biggest mistake in this law was not selling a bit as a redistributionist law. People are going to start finding out over the next year that this is a redistributionist law, and the reason they're paying more is exactly in the law. It is not a bug. It is a feature of the law. And that is going to come back and bite them in the 2014 election in particular. So that's what the individual mandate does. It subsidizes the rest of the costs of the law. Now, there are some direct subsidies and some other taxes, and I won't get into the 2,700-page law, but that's a general idea. So the next question is what they're going to talk about more is can Congress do this under the commerce power in particular, and I won't, I won't get into more of the nuances of the way decision worked out. But I, going back to civics class, I always thought this was very simple. And I was recently uh, lecturing to a bunch of Germans about this, and they, they were saying, as you get from Europeans a lot, well, what's wrong with having more health care? What's wrong with this being the case? Why, why, why are Americans so against Washington, D.C. having this better health care system? Your health care system is so bad. If you have any European friends, perhaps you've heard this before, and I, you have to say, no, the way you're thinking about this is wrong. The question you have to ask yourself is, as a German, how would you feel if Brussels took over your health care decisions? Not Berlin, but Brussels. You'd be like, well, no, Brussels doesn't have power over that. Well, like, well why doesn't Brussels have power over that? They kind of have power over commerce, and all of the laws of Germany affect the other laws of the EU. So why doesn't Brussels have power, Brussels have power over health care? And that's the question that we dealt with with hundreds of years in our jurisprudence in our Constitution was the idea that commerce is a type of thing and not a zone of effects. 
Now, it's very difficult to understand exactly what type of thing that is. Is it manufacturing? Is it local agricultural laws? But what